Greetings, beloved. We want to welcome you again into our series of the book of Daniel. We are continuing to study the book of Daniel. We are going to be looking at Daniel chapter 3 today. Very exciting and important study we are going to have. In fact, what I want us to do in Daniel, in this study, in today's study, Daniel chapter 3, I want us to see that in the series of events and themes that sort of are emphasized and are brought out so clear before us in Daniel chapter 3, I want us to see that God wants us to see that this is how he's going to work in the end of time. We are going to see that some of these themes that we are going to see in the book of Daniel, they are not only in chapter 3 itself, but they come up even in the whole book of Daniel as, as we are going to see now. Before we begin our study, I want us to have a word of prayer. You can kneel where you are or we can, you can just bow our heads um, as we pray. Let us, let us pray. Our kind and loving Father, Lord, we want to thank you so much um, for the time that you have given us, Lord Father, as we are going to be beginning to study this book, the book of Daniel. We are really grateful. We are truly, Lord Father, blessed. Uh, that we can have an opportunity to open these books of the Old Testament, the book of Daniel. That is so, so, Lord Father, timely for our time and so prophetic and so applicable, Lord Father, in the times that we are living in, that we can be able to understand where we are and um, how we are to prepare for what is coming, the crisis that is going to um, befall God's people. We pray that Lord, you may give us an experience, the experience that is spoken of in the spirit of prophecy, that when the books of Daniel and Revelation are better understood, the people of God will have an entirely different religious experience. We seek that experience, Lord. We want to be revived. We want to see clearly and understand and to be established not only spiritually, but also intellectually into the truth. Please, we pray that you may bless us with your presence, even now as we are going to begin the study. We pray, Lord Father, that you may open our eyes and help us to draw even much closer uh, uh, to you as never before. We pray that Jesus may become our friend and we may see, Lord Father, the closeness, the intimate relationship that He, that you desire, Lord Father, to be to, to have with us. For this, we pray and thank you for listening to our prayer because we have prayed in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Saints, as I've said, we are just going to look at Daniel chapter 3. We, we must remember or it must be remembered that in Daniel chapter 2, we, we were looking at uh, the dream that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had had that God reveals through his prophet Daniel. And he brings it uh, to Daniel. Now, in Daniel chapter 3, we see Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who sets up an image of gold. He sets up this image. He invites everyone to come to the dedication. And um, he is told that there are certain Jews that are not bowing to this image that he has set up. And... They are brought forth, the three Hebrew boys are brought forth, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to answer for why they are not bowing down to worship this image. And the events unfold after that. But I want us to see something very interesting. Before maybe we get into the events that we are just going to see there, I want us to see the theme, or probably maybe understand, or bring to our attention, the theme that is brought out in chapter 3 and the rest the rest of the book of Daniel. We are going to see that shortly. Uh, Daniel chapter 3. Let's go to Daniel chapter 3. I want us to see from verse 15. Very interesting. Verse 15. The Bible here points out something that is very important that I want us to take note of. Daniel chapter 3 verse 15. The Bible says, this is, um, this is what the king is going to say to the three Hebrew boys. They are brought before him to answer why they do not, you know, bow down to worship the image. And look at verse three. It says, 
Now, if you be ready that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the, you know, the sackbat, the sepulchre, tree, the, the dulcima, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have set up, which I have made. Well, but if you worship not, you shall be cast at the same hour into the midst of the burning fairy furnace. And who is and who is that God that shall deliver you out of the out of my hands? Now I want you to see from that verse what Nebuchadnezzar is really saying, and especially the last um, the last sentence of that verse, verse 15. He says, he says, and who is that God? that shall deliver you out of my hands. So right from the start, we are seeing that the king of Babylon or Babylon is setting itself in conflict with God, literally in conflict or in direct, you know, confrontation with the God of Israel, that who is going to set, who is that God that is going to deliver you out of my hands? So we are going to see that this is something that runs out of the book. It, it's sort of like just throughout the book of Daniel that Babylon is constantly setting itself against the God of heaven, against the God of Israel, against, you know, his laws, against his authority and everything. Literally, you know, Babylon is opposed to God in some way. We see this when you begin for probably maybe when, when, when you look at chapter one, we see Babylon going into Jerusalem, destroys the city, bans, you know, the city and leaves the city in ruin, takes its people to be captive and takes them to be captive. So, you know, constantly we are brought into this picture uh, of Babylon in opposition, in confrontation, in conflict with the crisis that is brought out here. And it's very clear, you know, into the mind of the king that the king is opposed uh, to, to everything of God's people, you know, to their captives while they are there in Babylon. So that is something that I really want us to see. But what I want us to see here is that God here is set up as a deliverer. You know, this theme of deliverance is repeated in chapter three. And, uh, you know, we see a God who is, uh, who is determined in some way to come and deliver his people um, from the fiery furnace, from the fiery trials that they encounter. Uh, and I want us to see that um, that theme repeated or that concept repeated in chapter 3. Verse 16, the Bible says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve, now look at this, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. Verse, uh, the next, the next, the next line, it says, and he will deliver us out of thy hands. Two times in that verse is that word, is that concept repeated that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they are making it clear that the God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the fairy finance. He will deliver us from the fairy finance. Um, look at verse... Um, I want us to look at verse, um, verse 19. Yeah, verse 19 and verse 20. It says, or let's start from verse 18. It says, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury. And the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore, he spake and commanded that they should, um, they should heat the fire or the furnace. 
one seven times more than it was or it was want to be heated. Yeah, so I think it's very clear from those verses that the king was very furious. He was very angry at the response and at the determination that he saw and the, the resolution that he saw that Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego had and their devotion towards God that they were not going to uh, they were not going to band. They were not going to, you know, sell out in some way, if you can use that that phrase. Or they were not going to compromise their integrity to God, um, whether they are threatened of death or their, you know, their livelihood or anything of that sort. But they were going to stand true to God, no matter the circumstances. And and so we see that this theme of deliverance is something that is very repeated in, in the book of Daniel. In fact, it's interesting because when we read in chapter 6 of Daniel, we see the same thing. Uh, different scenario here in chapter 6 where we see, um, you know, people close to, you know, in some way to the governments trying to persuade the king to make laws that will make Daniel to choose between, you know, obeying the law of God or obeying the law of the states. And as a result, Daniel chooses when that law is made and when they are successful to make the king to make a law that will force Daniel to choose between obeying the laws of God and obeying the laws of the states that he, you know, obeys or chooses to obey the law of God. In chapter 6, Something that is very important, what I want us to see uh, about this, this concept of deliverance and how it is just repeated in, in the chapter, uh, repeated. Yeah, so mm, look at verse 14. It says, chapter 6, verse 14, it says, Then the king, when he heard these words, was so displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. So the king wanted to deliver, um, you know, Daniel. And he really wanted to do anything in his power to help him, even though it proved later on that there was nothing that he could do. But the Bible continues in verse uh, 16. I think we can see in that verse two times is that word repeated, the issue of deliverance. Um, verse 15, Then this man assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and the Persian is that no decree, no statute which the king has established may be changed. Verse 16, Then the king commanded and they brought the Daniel and cast him into the den of lions now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God whom thou servest continually, look at what he says, he will deliver you. He will deliver you. And verse 18, starting from verse 18, Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting, neither uh, were, neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. So he didn't sleep. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, the servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver it. Something is repeating that he said in verse 14. The God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lion's den. So the issue of deliverance of God's people delivering um, the faithful ones that are going to remain faithful to him in the last days is something that is repeated and brought up now and then in the book of Daniel. Um, we can even look at verse, um, look at verse, take note of verse 27. We can start from verse 26. It says, I made a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, man, um, 
Man trembled and feared before God of Daniel, for he is a living God and steadfast forever, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall uh, be even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth, and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth, whom uh, who, he, who have delivered Daniel from the power of the lions, from the, pyre, from the power of the lions. So many times, so many times, if we can count how many times is this word, this concept mentioned in the book of Daniel, it's so many times. In the book of chapter, in chapter three, we see that that concept is constantly repeated. The issue of what God is going to do in the last days, in the crisis that God's, God's people are going to face when they are going to be preaching the three angels message. And that is going to bring them into confrontation with the government of the day and uh, the laws of God and the commandments of God are going to be in direct opposition to the government of the day. And God's people are going to have to choose whether they are going to obey God or they are going to compromise their allegiance to God and give you know, obedience to the state. We see clearly that those that are going to be faithful, those that are not going to compromise their integrity, their allegiance, their devotions, their commitment to God, the Bible is making it very clear that God is going to deliver them. God is going to come to their rescue. In other words, faithfulness, if we are faithful to God, God is going to come. Uh, and we are going to see how God is going to do that in the last of eight. In fact, when you read in Daniel chapter 12, um, let's go to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. This is something that is brought up. In Daniel chapter 12, the Bible says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Uh, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. Now, I'm going to repeat this. This is something that we have been saying, I think, now and again. But it is well um, to repeat it again that the events and the themes and the experiences that are brought out in the book of Daniel, um, they are a type of what is going to happen to God's people in the end of time or when the crisis of the Sunday law is going to break up and God's people are going to go through this very trying time. This are the type. So in other words, this events that we read in or that we are we are actually confronted with in Daniel chapter 3, they have a worldwide end time spiritual application to God's Israel, um, to God's end time people. Yeah, they, they have an application. We are going to see this and we are going to see the link, I think, just later now in our study when we look at um, Revelation chapter 13. We are going to see how uh, how applicable this is even to the end times. But we see clearly in the Bible, in chapter 3, the theme of deliverance of God's people. In chapter 1, God comes uh, for his people. They are not going to compromise with their diet. They are not going to defile themselves with the diet and the wine that was offered at the king's table. And God comes. You know, uh, God comes for them. God is able to, you know, be faithful in that he gives them wisdom. He gives them understanding and he is able to bring them. And they are more 10 times better than all the wise men of Babylon. In chapter two, when the wise men are threatened of, they are threatened of death and Daniel and his friends also have to die. We see how God comes together 
to rescue them in that he reveals to Daniel the dream and he allows time to pass, you know, and he gives the king uh, favor over Daniel and allows time to pass and he comes and he reveals the vision to him. So constantly, even in chapter three, we see in the fairy furnace how God comes together to deliver his people, to rescue them from the trials that they encounter. Chapter 6, we see the same thing. In chapter, chapter 12, and verse 1, the concept is mentioned. So we see throughout the book of Daniel that the concept or the idea of deliverance is something that in the end of time, just before Jesus comes, just before Jesus comes, God's people are going to go through very serious trying times. Very serious trying times. And God is assuring his people that he is going to come through. He is going to deliver them. He is going to rescue them from all of those trials of the, the modern uh, Babylon. Uh, and the agents of Babylon that are going to accuse God's people uh, and, 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 and the mechanism that is going to use to try to discourage, to persecute, to try, uh, you know, to put fear into God's people's mind. God is assuring his people that he's going to come and deliver them. I think that is a very important uh, thing to understand, especially in a time where there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of intimidation, there's a lot of uh, threats, you know, of a loss of jobs, as a loss of uh, property, um, and a loss at the end of time, and loss of our life. When our lives are going to be threatened, we need not to compromise. We need not to compromise the principles of God. We need to stand true to God. We need to stand faithful until the end and god is going to show that he is faithful he's going to deliver us from all of the circumstances and the the you know the positions or uh, situations that we are going to be brought under i i think that is very important let's go back to daniel chapter 3 um now let's start from verse 1 the secondly we have seen the first one the theme of deliverance repeated. Secondly, I want you to see from Daniel chapter 3. When something says, let me just maybe repeat this. When something in the Bible is repeated more than once, that something, that thing is very important. And God wants us to pay attention to it. You know, that's, that's something that really can help us. When something is constantly repeated, God is trying to impress upon our minds the importance, the significance of that thing and the attention that we should give to whatever that God is trying to repeat and impress upon our minds. That's why we have the gospel, the four gospel, all of them, they are talking, you know, about the life of Jesus. Uh, so in other words, God wants us to uh, study his life, to acquaint ourselves, you know, with the events uh, of his life, and to understand and to know him, uh, you know, as, uh, you know, as, as much as possible. So I'm, I'm really trying to make the point that uh, the concepts and ideas that are emphasized and repeated and sort of impressed and given so much prominence and significance in chapter three, it's very important for us to pay more attention to them because they are very important for end time application of what is going to happen to God's people or what uh, the forces of evil and Satan are going to do uh, against the, the forces of good and against the kingdom of God and his people. Look at verse one of chapter three. Chapter three of Daniel, the Bible says, Nebuchadnezzar king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Jura in the province of Babylon. So he makes an image of gold. Daniel, uh, oh, King Nebuchadnezzar makes an image of gold. So it's clear from right on from this verse 
that the kingdom that is ruling the earth or the empire that is in power is the kingdom of Babylon. We, we saw uh, from chapter 2 when Daniel is interpreting the dream, he says, you are the head of gold, pointing to Nebuchadnezzar as the king of Babylon. So we see here uh, multiple times in this chapter that the power uh, that uh, has rulership uh, is the kingdom of Babylon. That is very important. We are going to see this. Um, uh, and the Bible says, but, but now there is an expression that I want us to see, which uh, is pointed out in verse 1 and throughout the other verses of, uh, of chapter 3. The Bible says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up. That's the phrase, that's the expression that I want us to look into. The Bible makes the point that Nebuchadnezzar set it up. He's the one who made the image. But as if that is not enough, the expression is brought up that he had set it up. Who set it up? The king of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar. Look at verse 2. Then Nebuchadnezzar, king, set, sent to gather together the princesses, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. Number two. Verse three. Then the princesses, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the province were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. Number three, they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Number four, look at verse five that at that time you hear the sound of the sonnet, the flute, the harp, the salt bird, the salary, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music. You fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. Number five, look at verse seven. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the cerebral, the cemetery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the language, the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. Number seven. Look at verse um, verse fourteen. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do you, do, do not ye serve my gods and worship the golden image which I have set up? Number eight. In fact, we have, we have skipped number 12. The Bible says, There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This man, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Number nine. So nine times, nine literal times in chapter three is that expression used that the king, was the one who had set up the image. Constantly is repeated that idea, that thought. How significant is that? How important is that? That it is expressed at least nine times that the image of gold was set up by the king of Babylon. We are here talking about a political entity. He is the king of Babylon. But he is setting up an image and he is making a dedication, a ceremony where he is dedicating this. And he calls all the people who are serving under his jurisdiction, people under his power, 
that the, the Babylon is the is the is the nation that is in power in all the world. He rules all of the so people that are serving under him, he calls them the governors, the counselors, you know, and all of the people to come to the dedication of this image. And what is the object of them coming? It is to serve, it is to worship. This is something that is done by the king. So we see a political power that is making a religious establishment, that is making a religious law or commanding people to worship, you know, the God, uh, the gods of Babylon, the sun God of Babylon. So it's, it's very important. I think we can see constantly in the book of Daniel that, uh, that this is an act uh, that, that the Babylonians or the king of Babylon is actually was the one who was responsible in making. So the Bible is making that point constantly that this is something that Babylon was doing. This is something that the king had set up. Now, let us just look at this. Very interesting. Um, he makes an image of gold. We want to go to Exodus. Um, Exodus chapter 20. He makes an image of gold. He commands everyone to worship this image. Exodus chapter 20. I'm going to read from verse 1. Very familiar chapter and familiar verses. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So it is clear, according to, to God's command, that there was not going to be any image that God's people were going to have. They were not going to have no image before them. Thou shalt have, oh, sorry, thou shalt have no other gods before me. This is something that the children of Israel were taught. They knew, they understood that they cannot serve other gods. There's only one God. The God who created the heavens and the earth, the seas and the fountains of waters. And the Bible continues in verse 4, or in verse 4 it says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So God says, you should not have no other gods before you. You shall not have any graven image. And he says, of any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. So God is making it clear that he doesn't want his people to worship other gods. They don't, they cannot make an image, you know, and, uh, you know, serve that image or dedicate, you know, their service to him in any way. So it was clear when Nebuchadnezzar was making this, that Nebuchadnezzar was in clear war, in confrontation, as we have pointed out, with the law of God. Because he was seeking worship. He was seeking worship or directing the whole world and his kingdom and those under him to worship a foreign god. A false god. The gods of the Babylonians. The sun god. And in that he was bringing himself in close confrontation with God, in defiance with God in some way. So we see here that the law of God in the end of time, the law of God, the Ten Commandments, those ten precepts, 
as what is going to bring us into direct confrontation with the enemy. In direct confrontation with the enemy. That one of the things, in fact, there is um, a quotation I am going to read, um, but not now. We are going to read it. We are going to see that the law of God is going to bring us into confrontation with the enemies of God's people. What is going to bring us into persecution, what is going to bring us to be suspicious to the governments of the world and to the powers that be is the law of God. For the fact that we promote and uphold and make the law of God the foundation of our living is going to be a serious problem for God's people in the end of time. And specifically, specifically, the fourth commandment, as we are going to see. Because something that is also brought out, I think very clear in chapter 3 of Daniel, uh, that is at the center of this crisis, is the issue of worship. Is the, the issue of worship. I think, if not 10 times, that, that word or that concept is mentioned in chapter 3, the concept of worship. So in other words, worship is at the center of the last crisis of the modern Babylon towards God's people. It was in the, in the times of Daniel. It is in this end time, the issue of worship. And you cannot talk of worship and not talk of the law of God. You cannot talk of worship and not talk about the law of God. You cannot talk of worship and not talk of the Sabbath commandment. So we see clearly that since here, we, we are looking at the events here, really. We are looking at the events here that if we are faithful to God, if we keep the law of God, if we promote the law of God, the law of liberty, as James calls it, that is going to bring us into serious problem with the enemies of God's people. And Satan is going to use everything in his power, all things, that, all the weapons that are in, you know, in his kingdom. He is going to will them to try to crush God's people because of God's law. It was in the rebellion of Satan when he fell in heaven, at the center of the great controversy was the law of God. Because of the desires that he had to be like God and uh, to overthrow God's government, that could only be possible if the law of God is taken out. Deceives man in the Garden of Eden to disobey God. By deception, by lies, he does this. And so I think that that point is, um, does make sense since, and we are able to see that from, from the book of Daniel. So the concept of deliverance, that's the first thing. Secondly, we see that the Bible is bringing into significance or is bringing to our mind an impression that... Uh, that the king of Babylon, he's the one who set up, who set up this image, who set up this image. We are going to see the end, the end time application of that um, as we look at Revelation chapter 17. The third thing, um, at, at the center mm -hmm. and, you know, the center and something that is brought to prominence here at the center of everything is worship. Are we going to worship God or are we going to worship uh, Satan uh, who's going to use the earthly governments and every agent to try to force the whole world to worship him? That is what is at stake. Are we going to listen to God? Are we going to obey him? You know, we can even see now uh, since COVID, I think, um, 
there have been attempts, even in the legislative bodies of this world, whether it's in the United States or in our world, in, in our own country, South Africa, we have seen that there has been attempts of uh, to try to, you know, to try whether through the education system with the bill that has been passed now, the Bella Bella bill, uh, that is an attack on the home, the, the homeschooling. We, we really can see from the onset that the legislative bodies are in some way are used, Satan uses them to try to uh, discourage and try to bring God's people in conflict with the earthly governments and the governments that be and the bodies uh, and, and we can see this in many ways in how Satan is doing that so the law of God and worship is at the center of it is at the center of this Now let's go to Daniel chapter 3. I want us to just see um, from verse, we are not going to read all the verses. I'm just bringing out things that I think are very important for our study. Um, I want us to draw our attention to, to what the king does. So the king sets up a statue. He invites everyone. That is a very important, he invites everyone. So invites uh, together the princesses, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the province to come to the dedication of the image. Yeah, the counselors, the sheriffs, the rulers, the provinces, the treasurers, the captains, the judges, the governors, everyone. That's a very important detail in the events that are brought out here. That... In fact, we are going to see, I think in verse 12, it is very clear when you contrast that with verse 12, that as opposed to those who were worshipping the image with those that didn't worship, that it was only the three Hebrew boys that stood and said, we are not going to worship. With the rest of all the people of the world, I would want to believe as well that... Um, Zedekiah was probably there at that meeting, attended that meeting because Nebuchadnezzar had set him there uh, to rule and he was under his rulership. So they are first. So, and all, you can think, and all the people, uh, by the way, of uh, all those children uh, of Judah uh, from, from Jerusalem who were taken captive, all of them, all of them, they bowed down and worshipped the golden calf. So we see, you know, very interesting that the majority of all the world is going to worship the image. Now, how do we come to a point where people, the people of God that were taken captive in chapter one that came and were also in the palace like Daniel, how did, how did it come? that when they knew that they are not supposed to bow down, they are not supposed to have other gods, they are not supposed to bow down and worship an image, you know, to the dedication of the gods of Babylon. How do they come to the point where they bow down and worship with the rest of the Babylonians and the rest of the world? How does that come to be? Now, the key is exactly what we see in is exactly what is pointed out in chapter one in chapter two in chapter one the test the first test that is brought to them of diet they could not stand that test another test that are brought off they could not stand that test the test of their identity and all other tests that are brought, but in chapter one, the prominence, I think something that is very important is the test of appetite. Is the test of appetite. In Great Controversy, this is pointed out. In fact, 
there is a quotation that I want to read. There is a quotation that I want to read. I want you to see this uh, from Great Controversy. This is Great Controversy 591, 591, Great Controversy 591. Uh, the Bible says, Satan's policy in this final conflict with God's people is the same that he employed in the opening of the great controversy in heaven. He professed to be seeking to promote the stability of the divine government while secretly bending every effort to secure its overthrow. And the very work which he was thus endeavoring to accomplish, he changed upon the loyal angels. The same policy of deception has marked the history of the Roman Catholic Church. It has, it has professed to act as a vicegerent, I hope I pronounced that word correctly, of heaven while seeking to exalt itself above God and to change his law under the death, sorry, under the rule of Rome, those who suffer death for their fidelity to the gospel were denounced as evil doers. They were declared to be in league with Satan and every possible means was employed to cover them with reproach, to cause them to appear in the eyes of the people and even to themselves as vilest of, vilest of criminals. So it will be now. While Satan seeks to destroy those who honor God's law, he will cause them to be accused as lawbreakers, as men who are dishonoring God and bringing judgment upon the world. And bringing judgment upon the world. So we see that the same method that he used, it is the same method that he's going to use with God's people. With God's people. And... If Daniel was not faithful and his friends in the first chapter of Daniel when they were brought as captive to Babylon, if he was not faithful there, if he was not faithful when he met the crisis in chapter 2 to trust God and to trust in prayer, those two things that are faith in God and faith that God, when, when they ask him and, and he is going to be faithful to answer, that which they have asked in prayer. So prayer and diet. In fact, I think it's in a um, in great controversy. The Bible uh, prints out in the chapter entitled The Snares of Satan says, those who would, ne who would neglect prayer and the searching of the scriptures will be overcome by his attacks. That is something that is brought up very clear from the Bible. So because they were not faithful, in chapter 1 and chapter 2, God's people, they could not stand. They could not stand. And they compromised and they fell down and worshipped the golden cup, the golden image, sorry, the golden image that the king had set up. That is something that is brought up very clear. So the majority of the world, including God's people, we are, we are told here, are going to fall down and worship the golden image because of unfaithfulness in the things that God clearly has directed that they are going to be very important in preparing us for the final crisis before us. Diet is one of them. Prayer is one of them. The searching of the scriptures is one of them. Faith in God. Is one of them. When we read in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus asked a very solemn and important says, When the Son of Man come, shall he find faith on the earth? Faith is going to be lacking among God's people in the last days. And this is going to lead to compromise. This is going to lead to uh yeah, compromise of their principles, compromise of their integrity disobedience to God's law and obeying the, divine, the the state's laws as opposed to the clear revealed will of God in his words. So faithfulness in the little things that God has given us, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, 
do all to the glory of God. That's what the Bible says in the book of Corinthians. Now, that's what I, want us, I wanted us to see. Um, that the majority of the world worshipped, including among God's people. So it means they are, there is going to be a shaking in God's people. And this shaking is going to test. It's going to test. And until that test comes, uh, we are really not, uh, we, we, we are going to see clearly that um, who is on the Lord's side and who is not on the Lord's side. It's a very important test that is going to come. If we are not faithful now, a daily basis to God, um, we are not going to be able to stand this test that is going to come to God's people. Another point I wanted us to, 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 to bring out there, uh, from verse 13, from verse 12, it says, There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought this man before the king. Verse 14. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have served? Now I want us to see that in trying to get God's people to bow down and to worship the golden image, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what uh, Nebuchadnezzar does, Nebuchadnezzar was a very intelligent king. He was very intelligent. And he knew what he was doing. So he didn't use force at first. He didn't try to compel them to worship at first. He didn't do that. He calls them. After calling them, he tries to reason with them. So he tries in some ways to persuade them. You know, he does not use force at first to try to get them to worship. He tries to reason to them. He says, he tries to see them. You know, he tries to make them, you know, uh, by reason to try to get them to worship. And so he gives them their choice. You know, he uses persuasion. And more than persuasion, he uses uh, the scenes, you know, of glamour and splendor. You can imagine how the scene was if you have all the dignitaries of the world coming, you know, and all of them are assembled. All of them, the, the, you know, the, the lawyers, the, you know, the dignitaries and all the honored people of the world have come and they have assembled themselves here. And you can see a statue has been lifted up, so gigantic and so massive. And it's a statue of gold. So impressive it must have been the scene. The Bible points out that that is what he uses. So we see that the kingdom of Babylon does not only use persuasion, but the first thing he tries to use is splendor and impression, you know, and this impressive, gigantic scene or gigantic with this impressive, gigantic uh, statue to try to impress into the minds of those who are looking into this, you know, and command in some sense, uh, some form of, worship by that and he uses persuasion he uses a reason to try to get them to worship but evidently in these verses the bible says now if verse 15 if now ye be ye be ready that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet the flute the harp the sackcloth the sacred tree and the desolma and all kinds of music you fall down and worship the image which I have set up. Well, but if you worship not, you shall be cast into the same, uh, in, in the same hour, cast the same hour into the midst of the Bene Fairy Furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? So what does he do? 
So he tries to use impressive scenes and glamour and splendor to try to impress their minds. That is why we cannot trust our senses to try to uh, impress their minds that they should be able to worship. Worship the golden image. He's not successful. And he comes and uses reason and persuasion to try uh, to give them the chance to think about this more properly. Reason with them. Uh, but they are not persuaded. They are very resolute and they are not going to do that. And it's very clear that he threatens them. Now, the last thing is death. The last thing is death. Now, look at verse, the preceding verses. It says, verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fairy finest, and he will deliver us out of thine hand. O king, uh, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So they are not shaken. They are not shaken in any way by the threat of death, by anything. There is nothing, whether persuasions or scenes of splendor and glamour, are not in any way going to make them to compromise and to worship a golden image. No, they are not going to do that. Reason, they are not going to do that. They are not going to be even by the threat of death force as the king tries to compel them to worship. They are not going to be allowed. They are not going to allow themselves to be intimidated by that. They are committed, they are resolute, they are firm in what they believe in and they rather die than disobey God. That's a very serious, serious commitment. It's not easy. You could, you could see this very clear when many of us and our people were tested through COVID. And if you don't take a shot, uh, you're going to lose your job and uh, you, you, you really can imagine a lot of people uh, took shots. A lot of people took shots. They said, who's going to pay my house? Who's going to pay the bills? Uh, you know, the, the cars and all the other things. That was a, sit, a, 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 a snapshot. And trying to expose in some way. God was really allowing this to expose us and to see how unready we are for the final crisis that is coming. The Bible points out in Daniel chapter 3 that the fires were heated seven times. What does that mean? Seven times in the Bible, it's a complete, it's a complete uh, um, number. You know, that is used in the constantly in, in, in the Bible at the seventh day. We see the seven churches, the seven seals in the book of Revelation. We see, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, pattern of sevens uh, in the book of Revelation. It's a complete perfection. It's a number of perfection. It's complete, completeness in some sense. In other words, the trials you know, and the, the, the fairy fairness of the trials that the saints are going, they, saints, we, we really don't even have an idea of what is coming before us. It's really going to be so, so, the pressure and the, the pressure that is going to be extended at God's people. It's like, and, and how God's people are going to be brought to a point where their faith are going to be crushed by using all possible means and measures to try to intimidate, to discourage, to put fear and all kind of things to try to, you know, um, bring us to a point where we can disobey God. We really don't even have an idea. 
It's so serious, saints. It is very serious what we are dealing with here. It's very, very serious. It's very, very serious. Then the Bible is very clear that they are bound, they are thrown into the fire. And as the king is there and his servants, the king sees a foreman. He sees they are not hurt and anything. Then he comes closer. And when those that come close, his servants, they are bent. And he comes closer and he sees the son of man. And he calls them. And they come forth. There is no head. They are not head. They are not bent. Their clothes are not bent in any way. They are as they were when they went into the fire. There's not even a smell of smoke into their clothes. And what does the king do? He blesses the God of heaven. He praises him. And God is glorified. God is seen. His power is seen. And is is acknowledged by the people of the world. By the king of the world. Very important details, saints. Um, now, without wasting any time, let's rush and look at um, the end time implication of this. I think the link of Daniel chapter 3 with Daniel, uh, uh, with, with Revelation chapter 13. There are, kind of, there are a lot of things that we have mentioned there about Babylon. Um, we have mentioned the fact that Babylon was a universal power, a worldwide power that had um, authority and influence over all the people of the earth. The language is very evident in chapter 3 and what the king does in calling all everyone to come for the dedication. We can see that very clear from, from Daniel 3. Uh, we have also pointed out the fact that um, this is a political power, but it makes a religious pronouncement. That's the second thing about this power. Um, we see that uh, it makes a pronouncement of religion that uh, people should worship uh, the image and those that do not worship the image they are brought uh, to death you know there's a threat of death so there's a death decree the third thing and fourthly interestingly that what we see is that uh, he uses all means to try to persuade or bring god's people to the point where they can worship this image. Now look at chapter three, chapter 13, sorry, of Revelation. We're going to be reading from verse 11. The Bible says uh, of the two beasts that are spoken of there. This is the second beast. It says, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamp and he spake as a dragon. He spake as a dragon. We are not going to identify who this beast is. We all know. This is speaking about the United States of America. Look at what he does in verse 12. The Bible says in verse 11 that he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. Um, in Revelation chapter 12, we see that uh, Satan is uh, spoken of as a dragon. And one thing that is uh, pointed out about the dragon is that he persecutes God's people. We see this in chapter 12. And uh, he's constantly in war with God's people. That is the character of the dragon. He persecutes, he's in war, he's in conflict with God's people. And he exercises, verse 12, all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So the United States has power over all the earth. This is what is brought up in verse 12. If he didn't have power, he would not have caused all the earth and them that dwell on the earth to worship the first beast. If he causes all the earth and them that dwell on the earth, that means he has power of all the earth and authority of the people of the earth in some ways. So this is a worldwide power, political power that is going to be an agent and an instrument uh, in uh, in directing the world and the governments of the world 
to worship the image of the first beast. So we can see the similarities with Daniel chapter 3, verse 11. Verse 13 says, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of man. Do you see that he uses scenes of splendor to try to appeal to the senses of God's people or the people of the earth to try to seduce them to worship uh, this, uh, to worship, uh, to worship the first beast? Yeah, as we have seen in Daniel chapter 3, the king uses splendor and glamour and all the scenes, uh, you know, with this gigantic image that is so huge, that is, uh, you know, that is so impressive of gold to try to bring, uh, you know, in, in some sense, uh, God's people to try to worship this, this image. And verse 14 says, And he deceived them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image of the beast which had the wound by a sword. An image of the beast, an image of gold. And verse 15, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. We saw that those who do not worship in chapter 3, there is a death decree. In chapter Revelation of chapter 13, those who are not going to worship, they are going to be killed. So we see the similarities uh, of Daniel chapter 3 and Daniel uh, and Revelation chapter 13. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and in their hand. In fact, when you read uh, verse 8, the Bible says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So we see that the majority of the people of the world, the majority of the people of the world, including God's people, that would not have been faithful, that will compromise the truth, that would not be committed to the law of God, that the majority of the world are going to worship. They are going to receive the mark of the beast. They are going to receive the mark of the beast and they are going to observe uh, Sunday as the day of worship that is not sanctioned in the Bible. The Bible points that point very clear in verse 8, but points to the fact that those that are not written in the book of life, of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, uh, giving us an idea that those that are going to stand true to God, it's not going to be many people. It's going to be the few. It's going to be very few. So there is going to be a shaking in God's church. And those that are not going to stand true to God are going to compromise their faith. And as a result, they are going to receive the mark and worship and observe that day uh, that um, is not sanctioned in the Bible. Yeah, that's, um, that's very important, I think, for us to see saints. All of these events are going to come into fulfillment. The prophet Daniel chapter 3 the events that are pointed out there, we're not able to cover everything. But I think, uh, in my estimation and how I've just looking, I've been looking at this chapter, that the things that we looked at today, those are the things that are very important. Those are things that we really have to pay attention to, that the Bible is bringing, uh, you know, uh, to our attention. So it, it is with that, saints, that um, may God help us to be faithful. Uh, now, so that we may be able to stand when the crisis breaks up um, with the enemies of God and, and God's people that we will be able to stand and will be able to be counted among those who will be faithful. Um, I pray and um, 
I hope that um, this study is going to spark an interest uh, for you to dig deeper into these chapters. It's not very exhaustive, these studies, but that you may, you know, dig deeper into the Bible to try to understand more. And um, you may renew your commitment if you have backslidden in your relationship with God. Um, you know, take that privilege of prayer exercise the faith that God has given us um, you know and those principles that God has given us in his word and inspiration that we make sure that we are faithful in those little things. I pray that God may bless each and every one of you uh, as we continue to study. Uh, let us close with the word of prayer. Loving Father we thank you. We thank you so much um, for the study that we have just had um, of this important chapter of chapter three of Daniel. We have seen that you are Lord Father um, uh, going to come uh, and rescue your people in the end of time when the crisis breaks between those who are going to worship you, those who are going to uphold your law and going to stand true and committed to you that you are going to come to their rescue. We pray that you may help us to be faithful now uh, in the time of peace. In the time of peace, that when the time of war comes, we may be able, Lord Father, uh, to stand. We pray that you may really help us, uh, that when we are, Lord Father, at the time brought before the courts, brought before legislative um, assemblies and brought before the man, giants of intellects, men who will test our faith, men that will be, uh, you know, bring pressure to, to us that we may be able, Lord Father, to stand all of that crisis. Please be with our families, be with all of us, bless our church and bless each and everyone. Uh, who have listened to this. Um, we pray for all of this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And as for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied.